logging again. Um, I'm going to give this talk in English to make it, hopefully make it a little bit more understandable for anyone that's coming from outside. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, React and GraphQL today uh, and how it can help you uh, in your development stack. Before we get started, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a freelance developer coming with Develop17, um, but I've been, work, I've been lucky to be working the last two and a half years uh, for a company called Conferize that provides an event management system. So uh, they have a platform. So if you have to set up an event like JS Canarias, uh, you can set it up and you know, uh, get a website running and sell tickets and so on. That's what the company does. Um, I'm a front-end developer. Uh, I'm a father of two. Uh, I like running when I am not taking care of kids and with the family. And that probably also makes me a slow runner because uh, I don't get to run as much as I'd like. Um, I don't know if this is big enough. Should I try to make it a bit larger? Like that, maybe. Um, other than that, uh, I'm from a city in Spain called Cáceres. My region probably has the best jamón in Spain. Uh, uh, so, so if you're ever around there, uh, try some jamón. But I've been living half of my life in Denmark. Uh, and I've been, I've been raised in Denmark and working uh, in Denmark. I'm very active with uh, my local JavaScript community. And I'm also an event organizer for a conference called EDD that we have in Extremadura. It's been running for two years now and will be running again for the third year uh, next year. So let's get started. Um, I'd like to start by saying what this talk is not rather than telling you what it is. Um, we only have one hour. Uh, the talk is approximately 45 minutes. So this is not going to be a framework battle where we'll be comparing React and, you know, to Vue or to Angular or whatever. And it's not going to either be a 101 on React or GraphQL because there's just no time for it. Rather than that, my goal is to show you these technologies, show you the combination of them, uh, how, they can, how can they, can, they can improve your, your development process, and after all, to motivate you to try them on your own technological stack, you know, with your companies or at home or whatever. So uh, we're here in a JavaScript conference. Uh, we love the web, or we should. Maybe some of us hate it, but uh, after all, I believe that all of us, you know, have started working in JavaScript because to some extent we probably, you know, believe that we can build great things with JavaScript, right? And that's true. Uh, I'm sure you all work in really cool projects. Uh, but often when we start working with JavaScript and we start working with the web, we experience things similar to this, where, you know, things that are apparently very, very easy and that can be done with, you know, apparently no effort turn out to be really difficult, right? Um, and why is that? What makes it so difficult, right? Um, well, in order to sort of carry you into that, you know, process, I would like to show you uh, one of the screens that we have at Comprise. This is sort of like the entry screen that organizers see when they, when they have to, you know, uh, enter the system. And basically, it's just a screen where they see all of the conferences that they're organizing uh, grouped by what we call collections. So a collection will contain like a, a group of conferences. And for each conference, uh, we'll be showing like some, uh, you know, a conference card with a picture, the name of the conference, and uh, the date in which it takes place. So, for example, if, if you're Lailos or, or Ivan, you'll have a, a, a collection called uh, JS Canarias with all of the editions that have been running for JS Canarias, right? So, what would it take to build a screen like this if we didn't have frameworks and if we had to build this with REST, right? Well, First of all, we'd have to fetch all of the data that would require you rendering that collection on screen. And since you know, REST has this sort of HeyToa standard where everything comes in like uh, you know, all related entities come in like a URL, uh, then we'd get you know, references to all of the conferences within that collection and we'd have to go and fetch them over the wire. Uh, and as we go, you know, we'd get a crazy promise chain and we'd have to start aggregating data, throwing it into some sort of data store, and then using that data to render something out on screen, right? And that's just for showing the screen. If we have to mutate data and we, for example, have the concept of having a main conference where, you know, within your collection, you have one of those conferences being the main conference, and the collection has to know which one the main conference is, but the conference itself also has to know whether it's the main conference or not. Sort of like this, sort of if we change it, if we change which one is the main one. Well, what would that take, you know, what, what would we have to do? 
well, we'd probably have to send a request out, make a put request to some sort of REST frame, uh, you know, endpoint, update our collection data, but then since, you know, there's other entities that would get impacted by this change, we'd have to, you know, refetch those entities again, you know, get the conferences, make sure all their, their data is up to date, and then re-render again. So this is all a lot, you know, easier said than done because when we, when we run into these problems, which are apparently simple, we can't always predict the outcome of the changes. In this case, the example is pretty simple. But sometimes, you know, your server will be sending some sort of, you know, request to another server and you don't really know, you know, how the other related entities are going to be impacted or what's really going to happen, how your data is going to be looking after that request. So you have to be able to know when you, when you create those requests how you can locate and update all of the impacted entities in, you know, in the app. And that can become really cumbersome. And then after that, if you figure everything out, you also have to know which parts of the screen get re-rendered because it's, it's just not okay anymore to re-render everything. So you have to be able to, to be smart about how your app gets rendered, right? So at the end, all of this, you know, web apps uh, have a series of, of points that m make them become a little bit more complex. And I've tried to summarize those points over here. So first of all, they have to be modular. We have to build our applications in a way where we can define sort of components that can be reused, that can be loaded individually without depending on one another. We need to optimize rendering. We need to be able to, to you know, to say, okay, uh, only certain parts of the app should be, you know, re-rendered when changes occur. There's also a growing complexity of, of, you know, the data that's managed on the clients themselves, such that we manage more and more data on the clients by removing a lot of complexity on the server. So, you know, global state, and, and caching of data that we receive from our servers becomes a, a, a problem that we all have to tackle at some point. And then we also have the issue of data normalization. So it was just a few years ago, I don't know if you remember, that Twitter had an issue where like uh, the posts on their timeline were pointing to like inconsistent uh, profile pictures. So if you posted something a long time ago, an old picture of you would show up and then on newer posts you'd get your new picture uh, shown, right? And that's just a common data normalization issue where the data was pointing to an old set of data. And we have to take care of the, that kind of stuff uh, when we build our apps. We also have to think about mobile. And by mobile, it's not about only making our apps responsive. It's also about you know, not making too many requests over the network, not overfetching, and so on. And at the end, we have applications that, you know, that where we have to meet a lot of requirements, where we have to you know, be able to deliver real fast. So we need stacks that will allow us to, to iterate that fast, right? So, you know, often not when we, when we find these problems, well, the first thing we try to do is say, okay, well, let's try to use a, a front-end framework to solve some of these problems. And today we'll be thinking about React, but it could be just anyone like Vue or, or, or Angular. I'm not gonna get into the framework fight. I'll leave that for you guys. Um, so for anyone that doesn't know uh, React, basically the way React works is that it, uh, it allows you to define components, and each component will receive a series of external properties coming from another co component, for example, and then it will maintain an internal state, which it can mutate internally. So for example, like a counter or something like that. Um, based on those two, it will render out something to the DOM, right? And the, the, the really powerful thing about React is that even though these changes cause re-renders anytime properties and state change, React maintains like a memory representation, a virtual DOM, uh, such that whenever our components update, uh, well, you know, that they'll, they'll update that virtual DOM, compare it to the real thing, and only update, you know, the, the real parts of the DOM that have really changed uh, over, over, the, you know, over that cycle. And that's called reconciliation in React, and it's what made React, you know, uh, stick out as, as one of, you know, the most popular frameworks when it came out. React, if, uh, if this is a React component, React is also a really like expressive language. The whole idea of using properties and state uh, to, to, you know, to define the content that gets rendered allows us to move away from this sort of like imperative way of thinking, of having to clear things up, of having, you know, to, to think in, 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 in a, you know, sort of like a series of steps in the, the typical imperative way, uh, way of programming. It also has this JSX syntax where, where we can see here that within our JavaScript we can re return like, you know, this HTML-like uh, elements where some of them might be like, you know, normal, 
normal HTML elements like we see here, but others may be uh, components uh, which render some other HTML out to, to the DOM. So we can com combine components. We have a, a really good syntax uh, to, to render out content to the DOM. And so basically by choosing React, we managed to solve at, you know, at least two of those main issues that we, we mentioned initially, right? We, we can, since we have this component-based structure, we've solved mod modularity, and since we can control what gets rendered to the DOM, uh, and, and, we don't, and we don't do any unnecessary updates, we also manage to do optimized rendering. Um, global state management is somewhat managed by React. In, in a way, you could say that you know, the, the composition of all of the component states uh, will make up your global state, but that's not very manageable at times because you may need to read you know, the state on some other distant component. Um, and for that, React does provide an API called React Context, uh, which will allow you to do that sort of stuff. However, it is the React team themselves that say that you have to use it sparingly because it's not really being thought out you know, to, to be used for like massive sets of data or anything. So, We've solved a whole bunch of stuff with React, but we still have a bunch of stuff that need fixing. And at least for the next two points, people start saying, okay, so what, architectural, you know, what, what, what architectural choices can I make to start dealing with global state and data caching, for example? And there's many solutions out there, but probably the most common one is Redux, right? So the way Redux works is that it maintains like a centralized store, uh, which contains a state object which is basically just a, you know, a, a big JavaScript object that our React components can hook into so they can sort of like tune into little, part, you know, little parts of the state and receive that state in as a property uh, and, and render their contents according to that state. And if they want to mutate that state, well, all they have to do is send out an action, which is just an object uh, declaring their intent, saying, well, I want to increase a counter, I want to you know, save this message or whatever. And that set gets sent over to the store, and there's a module called the dispatcher, which, amongst other things, will hand this out over to some reducer functions that are just functions that generate a new state. So the functions take in the old set of state and the action and create a new state. So we've managed to solve some issues, but there's more here, uh, because Redux is a synchronous technology, meaning that if we have to deal with side effects, if we have to deal with you know, calls over the network, well, we have, to do, we have to add some stuff to it. We have to add a middleware to our dispatchers to do the, the, uh, the side effect management for us. So there's middlewares uh, in the form of libraries like Redux Sega, Redux Thunk, that will do that for us. And basically what they do is that they'll handle the async request and they'll allow us to define more actions to, for example, save loading state, errors, uh, you know, incoming data, and so on into our data store. So we have to add that to our stack as well. So with that, we'll have managed to deal with global state management and with data caching. But we still have three sort of lacking parts there, right? Uh, data normalization is nowhere to be found. So if we want data normalization, we have to add uh, a library like Normalizer, define a schema, and make sure that our data gets normalized before it's put in the store and denormalized before it goes out to the React components. So with that, we have managed to solve data normalization. So taking this back to our main screen where we're showing the conferences, rendering the collection screen would require rendering the app in empty state, empty state dispatching a series of actions that will load the collections, normalizing those collections, dispatching actions to save those collections, and then for each collection, do exactly the same thing with the conferences, and then deal with the loading states of each and every one of those moving pieces. So, my question to you is, is this less work? Because I feel that, yes, this is more robust. This is a lot you know, more powerful than if I didn't have absolutely anything. It's also a standard way of solving a problem, meaning that if you know, there's a lot of people using this, and if anyone comes into my project that has used this before, well, you know, um, they'll know how to move around. All they have to do is learn my API, and that's that, right? But how maintainable is this if I have to set up you know, hundreds of actions and hundreds of reducers and, and you know, uh, how does that scale with time, right? Because my experience to that degree is that it becomes really difficult. Because after all, what, it, what happens is that becomes overwhelming. And you know, those points that we managed to solve, yes, we do 
we have sold them, but you sort of feel uncomfortable saying, mm, I think, you know, I could, I could probably do this a little bit better. I could, I could probably, you know, I, I, I should be able to sleep at night without thinking about reducers, right? Um, and that's where I think, you know, GraphQL can come in to help us. And that's what, what, what I want to try to explain today. Um, so for anyone that doesn't know GraphQL, um, uh, I'd recommend you see a, a talk from Dylos last year. He, he explained it really well. Um, but my purpose to use to just understand the basics, uh, so it's, it's a query language and a server runtime. Um, and the greatest idea behind GraphQL, what really makes it a game changer, is that opposite leads to how React or, uh, sorry, REST works, where, you know, sort of, sort of it's like REST or any service layer works, where it's the server pretty much defining what you can get and how you can get it. Here, it's the clients that, you know, define what data they need and can retrieve it in that form from the server. And it can do so by using these connected types. So when you have, you know, uh, you, you, you retrieve a type from GraphQL, instead of getting, you know, references and URLs like you get in REST, you can actually, you get a real type and you can actually, you know, navi navigate in through that type and see everything that it has. And, and it does so by having like three basic types or operations, which are queries, mutations, and subscriptions that pretty much define themselves, but queries are for fetching data, mutations are for updating data, and subscriptions are uh, basically like, uh, you know, queries on WebSockets that will allow the server to push out uh, some content to the client. So in order just to uh, make you more familiar with this, I have a little demo of the Confrise uh, API that I'd like to show you. So um, this tool is called Graphical. It's something that the, the server runtime allows you to, to expose. Uh, and it, you can think of it sort of like a Postman a web version of Postman for REST, but for GraphQL instead. Over here you have a tab with your schema uh, where you can define all, where you can see all of the, the queries and mutations that exist. I'll make it a bit larger. Let me know if anyone's not seeing it properly, okay? Um, so basically you have all of the types, uh, all of the queries and mutations in your, in your API. So for example, we see here that we have a conference with a bunch of fields. Conferences can have attendees within them, uh, and the attendees also can have conferences that they've assisted to. And you sort of get, you know, that, that recursive data structure where you can, you know, if you wanted to, you could, you could go as deep as you want into the tree, right, and, and, and navigate through the data. Obviously, you don't want to do that, but it's a tool that, that you have at hand. So um, that makes it, that's one of the, of, the, of the great things about it. And here we have an example of a query, uh, where if you look on the left-hand side, uh, we use a JSON-like notation, uh, basically, it's basically almost JSON without colons, uh, to define exactly which fields we want to get, right? Uh, so here we're getting the, a user with uh, the first name and the last name, and then we're also getting his collections, and within those collections we're also getting the data of the conferences that he's gone to. And the response that we get for that data is a JSON response, pretty much in the same form that, we, uh, that our request was launched with, right? And uh, an example of, you, of a mutation here is uh, very similar to a query. It has the same structure. The good thing about mutations is that a mutation, for example, like this one, like creating conference, is always going to return a type. So within the body of that mutation, we define exactly what data we want to get back. Uh, on the response. So uh, a create conference mutation will, you know, create a conference, return that conference, but we only want to get the conference collection and the, uh, and the user that created it with some specific fields, right? Um, the response for that is over here. Uh, and as you can see, it's basically uh, very similar to, to how queries behave. So having seen that, here we go. Um, So the immediate benefit, without thinking about React, without thinking about integration, without anything, is that we reduce the round trips to the server. We can fetch what we want in one go, right? And there's no overfetching. You know, there's no, I'm getting this huge JSON or this huge, uh, you know, response in order to just read one field out, right? Um, data response and parsing is also greatly simplified. First of all, because you can define those types to look a lot like your business types, right? 
And second of all is because you don't have to go through all that aggregation of data that you go with when you have to you know, nest requests. It's also a lot more approachable and a lot more self-documented through tools like Graphical where you can see those types and you can play around with the API really easily, right? And there's many more benefits, but what I want to get to is that the real power with this comes when we start using the clients that are available for, for uh, starting to use GraphQL on our, on our technological stack. So there's two main clients, there's many more, but there's two main ones. One of them is uh, Apollo, and the other one that you see on your right is Relay Modern. Relay Modern is the one that Facebook builds, uh, and Apollo is uh, created by a company called Meteor. Um, the things I'm gonna cover from here on are with Apollo, basically, because it's what we've got more, most experience with, but they're all pretty much applicable to Relay Modern. The same concepts apply. There's not much difference, uh, just the technical details that will, will, will maybe change a bit. So what do we get with one of these clients? Well, first of all, we get a really, really easy integration with our front-end framework, be it Angular, React, Vue, or whatever. And what for me, the power that comes with them is how they can manage data caching and how they manage local state, okay? And that's what I wanna show you in these, this last part of the presentation. Um, so integrating them with our, with our client is as easy as we can see here, where we basically just have to take an Apollo provider component that we get from the, from the client library and provide it a property with the client that just points to our API, you know, we'll provide a URL, and where we can optionally provide it an, a cache, an in-memory cache object. And by providing that in-memory cache, this is optional, like I said, we get caching and normalization completely for free without having to do absolutely anything within our app. So I don't see why anyone would want to start this without uh, the cache, but it's, it is optional, okay? Um, once we do that, then we can start defining our queries within our components, and we can use a library called GraphQL tag for that which uses JavaScript template literals to just allow you to define the queries in the same form as we've seen before. Uh, we define exactly what we need. And then within our React components, um, then we can use those queries as we see here. There's multiple ways in React of applying these queries or calling these queries. To me, the most natural and the easiest one is with React. This is just an example of it. It's uh, this use query function. Which, where you hand it over the query that you're using, and then you get an object that contains a loading state and the set of data that's gonna be you know, coming back from your endpoint. Uh, initially, the data is empty, uh, then it will lodge the request over the wire. Uh, you can show a spinner while loading is true, and once that's available, then you can render your component out, right? Um, what's important here is that um, here, the component gets re-rendered every time the query state changes, meaning that if we're using the cache, not only is it gonna If we were using the cache, if any other mutation, any other component in our application change the contents of our query, not having launched the same query, just with a query that you know impacts the same fields that our query is sort of hooked into, our component will re-render. And our view will get updated without us having to do absolutely anything, right? So when we carry this out to mutations, it's basically the same thing. Uh, we can define mutations with the GraphQL tag library. And notice here, if we wanna change the primary conference, uh, how all of this becomes really relevant because we can tell our mutation to provide to us, you know, the main conference within a collection. It's gonna return our collection to us. We can, define, we can tell it to uh, return the main conference. But then we can also tell it to say, hey, for all of the conferences, within that collection, you know, give me back their is main field. Because even though I might not need it as, you know, when I get the response, it's, that's gonna update my cache. And then I'm not gonna have to do absolutely anything. All of my views are gonna get updated just right away, just because of how I define my mutation. So using that is very similar to queries. Uh, you provide, you know, you use the use mutation function and that returns an array with two elements, a mutate function and the mutation response. So when something happens, you know, uh, change the conference, uh, then you just have to call that functions with a series of variables, and that's that. That mutation will be fired. Uh, notice here how we're getting the, res the response body back. Uh, but like I said, uh, if you're using the cache, it's completely irrelevant, right? Because of this reactive sort of nature, 
uh, we, we don't have to do anything with it, absolutely. So it's very rare that if, in those cases that you use the cache that you actually really need the mutation response body at all. Um, lastly, I'd just like to comment on local state. So one of the issues that we, we spoke about before was how to manage local state. And dealing with local state on the client, and this is an example with Apollo specifically, is as simple as when we create that cache, we can initialize our local state to contain some set of data. So over here we have just that we're, we're going to have some local state in regards to flash messages shown on our screen. And initially we initialize that as being empty. And then inside the client creation, I'm not going to go into the details of this code, but it's my, uh, you know, uh, I just want you to understand that if you pass an additional parameter called resolvers with a series of extensions of, you know, of the mutation type and a series of functions that will do that local state resolving for you, well then that's all you have to do is part of the, of the client creation. So that allows us to go in to our app and start defining you know, mutations and queries that are going to be using that local state and all we have to do in Apollo, because this, this is Apollo specific, uh, is define the at client keyword. So anything marked with at client, the, you know, the, uh, which is kind of redundant, the, the, the client will look at it and say, okay, this has to be resolved locally. I do not have to go over the network to deal with this. Um, and lastly, I want to just remark the power of this in order to, uh, to integrate this kind, of, you know, this kind of way of thinking with local state into your development process. It can be become a really powerful tool for decoupling work between the front end and the back end. Uh, since we have this powerly defined APIs, if we want to you know, build a new feature like connecting a user profile to LinkedIn, for example, we could you know, sit for 10 minutes with our front end and our back end team, define the API, and start working separately. We could say, okay, well, you know, we, we're gonna add a field that's the LinkedIn profile to our user, we're going to add you know, a connect user to LinkedIn mutation, and our LinkedIn type, a profile type is going to contain an ID, a token, and a photo. And then we can each move away from each other, start developing the feature, and on the front end, we can just add some mock resolvers like I showed you before on, on our client, and just basically start you know, calling mutations and queries using those at client keywords. By the time we're each finished developing the features, it's as easy on the front as, and, and as removing the at client uh, keywords and just removing your mock data. And you're good to go. You know? There's always going to be something, right? But I mean, uh, experience tells me that it just makes integration super easy. Why? Because you're using the same technology for the whole process that later is the same that you're going to be using to go over the wire. There's nothing new. There's no, more ar there's no new architectural parts that make integration tricky after that. So we've turned those unhappy faces into happy faces because now we deal with global state management, data caching, and normalization with almost no setup, no additional architectural parts. Everything just comes almost out of the box, right? And with the technology as it is. And you know, mobile, our mobile users start becoming happy when they don't get all their data used up at the end of their month uh, because we're not going to be doing any overfetching. We're not going to be doing you know, uh, too many requests over the network that are unnecessary or, or anything like that, right? And at the end, you've seen it compared to Redux, for example, you know, we have an architecture that is just, has very little friction in regards to, you know, integrating components and having many moving parts. And that just allows us to iterate rapidly. It allows us to come to the point where we need to build a feature and we don't have to think about architecture. We can think about the feature and we can build it right away, right? So in all, you know, React and GraphQL, they're two amazing technologies. There's just many points that make them great. You know, we could probably fill slides with, you know, with many points and give many talks about them. And there's no doubt that they're really, really amazing. But to me, the way I see it is a little bit this way, sort of, right? Uh, so, so they're like Tannis' Infinity Stones, right? Like, they're all super powerful. They're all super cool. Uh, but it's when you put them together and you start integrating, you know, React uh, and the, the clients, GraphQL and the technology with JavaScript, that you really become, you know, Mr. Tannis here. It really makes you really, really, really powerful. And the experience that we have at Confrise with that you know, is that, that our development process just speeded up greatly 
uh, with, with this architecture. So that's that. Uh, thanks for putting up with me. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. The slides are available here uh, if you want to look at them, and you can also catch me on Twitter. Thank you.